Hello, everyone. Thanks all for registering. We will start soon. We we'll have just uh, uh, one or two minutes for more people to, do to join us. So you will start very soon. Again, we are all welcome. Thanks for, for being there, right, being here. And also, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. People are coming, great. Brazilian people saying hello. <laughs> okay. It's 10 to a.m. here in Brazil. I think we, we can start our webinar. Uh, so again, hello and thank you all for joining us. Uh, to discuss the trace new data on Brazil soy export and uh, how to address the links of this trade to deforestation and conversion. Uh, my name is Isabel Garcia Drigo. I'm from Ima Flora, and I will be moderating this webinar today. Uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to, to provide a couple of points of housekeeping before we start. I will do that uh, in English first, and, and then I, sh I switch to, to Portuguese. So to the, our foreign audience, uh, this couple of points. Um, so with this, this webinar, we will you have simultaneous, simultaneous interpretation into English and Portuguese. So please uh, click the globe icon in your uh, screen. Uh, at the bottom, at the bottom of the Zoom screen, which says interpretation, so you can select the language you wish to hear the webinar, and you can choose between languages. Uh, post your questions for our panel in the Q and A box, please, so you have time for questions in the second half of this webinar. The chat is also open for discussion. The webinar is being recorded in English and Portuguese, and this will be shared afterwards. For any media present here in our audience, uh, Trace would be happy to work with you. So please contact the email media arroba, trace, uh, dot earth with any queries that, that you, you have. Uh, now in, in Portuguese, uh, uh, to the sake of our time. Uh, bom, nós temos então aqui algumas uh, instruções well, iniciais. Well, we have a few initial instructions here, some housekeeping instructions to start with. This uh, webinar uh, has a simultaneous interpretation into English or Portuguese, so if you wish to hear the interpretation, uh, please click on the globe icon at the bottom of your screen and choose the language that you prefer to use for the webinar. Please use the Q&A uh, box uh, to submit your questions to the panelists. But, uh, and we'll have some time at the end of the webinar to uh, address and answer some of these questions. We also have a chat box, which is open for discussions and suggestions and questions. This webinar will be recorded in English and in Portuguese, and we'll uh, share uh, the recordings uh, with our audience later on. And if uh, for any media uh, contacts, both uh, Trace and uh, Emma Flora will be very happy to work with you. So please uh, make contact with us uh, through the email media at trace.earth for any questions that you may have. And without further ado, 
let's uh, introduce uh, our speakers uh, for this uh, panel. And I'll be speaking from now on in Portuguese, and you can follow the interpretation in English. So uh, we'll have with us today Tiago Reis, who is a leader for engagement in South America for Trace Global Canopy and Imaflora. We'll also have uh, uh, Lisandro Inakaki de Souza, who is a colleague of mine, who is a, a projects coordinator at Imaflora. And after these two presentations, we'll have a discussion with uh, uh, a few other panelists, including Deborah Gias, who is Senior Manager for Sustainability at the Consumer Goods uh, Forum. Uh, Laurent uh, Javourdin, who is a uh, counselor for the EU delegation in Brazil, and he uh, works with uh, Green Deal uh, issues. And we have uh, Lucy Smith, who is senior manager for the Soft uh, Commodities uh, Forum. So these are our panelists today, and we'll be able to engage with them uh, later in this webinar. And I would like to start by inviting uh, Thiago Hayes uh, to share with us some key findings and some uh, uh, results of this new uh, data set and set of information uh, uh, from Trace. So Thiago, the floor is yours. You have 10 minutes for your presentation. Well, thank you, Isabel. And thank you, everyone. I'll also uh, be speaking in Portuguese, and uh, since we have interpretation, and I'll try to uh, not to speak too fast so that uh, you can all follow the interpretation. So I'm very happy to be here with you today, and it's a pleasure to be able to share uh, these uh, new data with you today, um, highlighting the importance of the this uh, information not only with the Brazilian audience, but with all consumer markets uh, around the world. So just to start with a very brief uh, introduction, what is uh, TRACE? Well, TRACE uh, is a data-driven uh, uh, transparency and diligence initiative that uh, maps uh, trade and commodities worldwide that are exposed to deforestation and conversion of native vegetation in tropical countries. So just for the sake of reference, currently uh, today, uh, uh, we at Trace have mapped 62% of the global trade of these commodities that are exposed to deforestation. And um, who, I mean, what is Trace and where does it come from? Basically, it's a, a network of uh, civil society organizations and it also includes uh, uh, academia. Uh, and this enables a Trace to bring together specific expertise for each context, each type of commodity in each country. And that's how it generates a significant impact. And it's only possible because it's formed by a, a wide range of different organizations. And who are uh, who is Trace and what is Trace in Brazil? Well, we have a number of different organizations that uh, work with Trace in Brazil, such as Imaflora, for example. Now, what is uh, the scope of the data that we're going to be discussing today? Well, we'll talk about uh, Brazil's uh, soy exports in 2019-2020 and uh, the um, CO2 emissions uh, linked to these uh, exports. And we'll compare uh, these current data with 2004-2018 uh, uh, data, which were mapped previously. So the map, the, the previous data, which was already uh, available, uh, these data are not directly comparable to the most recent data, 2019-2020, because there's been a, a change in the availability of data. And this has uh, forced Trace to make significant changes in its model. So, of course, we can uh, have a look at this time series, but the data themselves are not directly comparable, uh, basically. Uh, the 2019-2020 uh, 
uh, data are slightly different because they uh, adopt uh, a different uh, model. Well, having said that, let's talk about the results. Well, in 2020, uh, uh, the uh, soy that was collected in deforested areas uh, covered a significant uh, area. And this deforestation was more intense in the Cerrado biome, which is the, the, the biome that's most neglected by the Brazilian forest code. And uh, I'll be talking a little bit more about this later on. So basically, 264,000 hectares of soy uh, were uh, reaped from the forested land in the Cerrado biome. It's basically twice the size of uh, the state of Sao Paulo. And we also uh, uh, identified active deforestation in the Pampas biome. And this can be seen very clearly from the most recent data released by MAP biomes. In 2020, we're talking about 196,000 uh, hectares of uh, soy that were linked to uh, the grasslands that was uh, deforested. And three of the five municipalities with most soy conversion in Brazil in 2020 were in the Pampas. And in the Amazon, which is a biome uh, best known to everyone, uh, soy fields cover 76,000 hectares of recently deforested land. And finally, the Atlantic forest, which is also a biome that uh, you know is protected by a specific law. There's the Atlantic Forest Law in Brazil, and any deforestation in the Atlantic Forest biome is illegal, with very rare exceptions. Uh, there were 23,000 hectares of, of soy that was uh, planted uh, in relation to deforestation in this biome. In terms of emissions, just uh, for us to have an idea, the total. Uh, harvested uh, soy in Brazil uh, was uh, responsible for the gross emissions of 103 million tons of CO2, which is approximately equivalent to all uh, emissions from uh, land use, uh, from the land use sector in Brazil in 2020, uh, using very recent data. Now, if we have a look at the companies uh, the traders and their exposure to this deforestation and uh, these emissions. Among those that are most exposed due to their activities uh, related to the sector, of course, we have uh, Bangi, Kaggle, ADM, which were among the top five in the previous period. But now they've been joined by Olam and Gavilon. So these are the five companies that are the most exposed to deforestation and conversion due to their operations. China is still uh, the domestic market that is most exposed to uh, soy-led deforestation. And considering the commitments that were made in this regard, we have assessed the soy flows that were covered are not covered by uh, zero deforestation commitments, both individual commitments, but also collective uh, commitments. Uh, in 2020, only half of all soy plantations in Brazil were covered by a, some sort of commitment. The other half were uh, completely uh, uncovered, or unprotected by these commitments. Another interesting uh, piece of information is the fact that uh, we found 133,000 hectares of uh, soy harvested in the Amazon linked to deforestation after 2008. So this contradicts the soy moratorium completely. So we haven't made a, a detailed analysis of this commitment or these commitments, but basically we are talking, uh, you know, in terms of data, 100. 33,000 hectares of soy was uh, were harvested in uh, areas that should have been covered by the soy moratorium in the Amazon. Another interesting uh, piece of information is that this deforestation is concentrated in uh, very few uh, municipalities. In 2020, only 
309 out of over 2,400 uh, municipalities, was approximately 13%, accounted for 95% of all soy production in Brazil linked to deforestation. In other words, about 2,000 municipalities uh, or 87 percent of uh, all the municipalities where soy is produced in Brazil, they uh, account for only 5 percent. Uh, so uh, if we consider a diligence, a due diligence system based on this risk analysis, uh, it tends to favor uh, soy sourcing from these low risk uh, areas. Uh, at the same time, this system might uh, help us to target deeper measures in terms of analysis, uh, verification, diligence, and traceability. And of, of course, everyone has to focus on that. But uh, we should be able to target these areas which are at a higher risk of deforestation and conversion. So increasing transparency in the supply chains by doing this, those, let's say, producers and traders that are more responsible, they would find it easier to demonstrate that their product is uh, deforestation free uh, so that they can meet uh, the requirements of uh, international markets. Now, thinking about the future and where we are expecting to be in the future. Now, we cannot not mention this change in uh, government in Brazil. So together with uh, these important promises, there's a great deal of responsibility too. And this is very important when we consider climate change, loss of biodiversity and human rights violations and everything that we are seeing happen in Brazil in front of our very eyes. But the fact is that this destruction of natural ecosystems linked to uh, the export of agricultural commodities, this actually undermines Brazil's uh, competitiveness and uh, reputation worldwide, in particular uh, regarding uh, soy production, which is the top product for Brazilian agribusiness. So these private and voluntary commitments, they have already proved to be insufficient to deliver the necessary changes. And this has been recognized also by a number of different governments, such as France, the UK, etc., which have their own regulations regarding uh, the export of commodities exposed to deforestation and human rights violations. And now the EU has its own regulations regarding that. So the question that I have here, and I'm not going to propose an answer, but just a question, we should be asking ourselves uh, what uh, should a major commodities uh, produced and exported such as Brazil do? Well, for me, we should start by implementing a robust, uh, transparent system for traceability and for the traceability of these commodities. And this has to be an open, public and transparent system, which should cover the whole country, not only some areas. One minute left. Well, uh, these uh, production chains for agricultural commodities, they can and must uh, increase their transparency in a wide and competitive manner. manner. And this is crucial for uh, those um, consumer uh, countries that have already their own uh, legislation. The Brazilian uh, agricultural sector has to be aware of that and has to work together in a concerted manner and I could give here Indonesia as an example. Between 2018 and 2020, 87% of the uh, refined palm oil exports uh, were sourced from refineries that publicly reported or on uh, where that oil uh, was sourced from. So this is a very good example of uh, uh, concerted transparency uh, measure and now uh, thinking a little bit about you know what's happened recently in the eu with where they have recently approved this uh, diligence uh, law uh, it was approved last year well uh soy conversion in the cerrado and pampas biome was uh, a lot wider than in the amazon so uh 
you have this system or this legislation that uh, covers deforestation in the Amazon, but hasn't included other biomes yet. And uh, this, in a way, it fell a bit short of what it could deliver. It's better than nothing, but it could uh, go a bit deeper into the problem. It's important to stress that future review should also include other natural systems, such as grasslands and other uh, types of biomes and vegetations. Otherwise, this legislation by undermine part of the mm, commercial benefits generated by uh, this law. Uh, and uh, there's also a risk that this law might have actually an adverse uh, effect by uh, um, encouraging uh, soy exports and the export of other commodities from these areas that are not protected by the legislation. So by excluding these areas from the scope of the law, it's as if the law was saying, okay, there's no problem destroying these uh, other biomes and these other areas. And having said that, this is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Tiago. Thank you for the uh, data. And now, before we listen to Lisandro. We are going to have a very quick pool, as uh, it were, which is going to come up very quickly. So I'm going to read the questions, okay? They're going to come up on this poll, and the interpreters will uh, translate for you. So the questions, what's most urgent to turn the Brazilian soybean sector sustainable. So what's most urgently needed to make the Brazilian soy sector sustainable? And then you have this question, okay, and then you have the three options below that you're going to start to answer. Okay, so this is poll one, we have three questions, uh, sorry, three answers to that question. Just a few more minutes uh, to uh, vote, a few more seconds. Just the mo what is most urgently needed to make the Brazilian soy sector sustainable? Okay, so we are closing up the poll. So here are the results. So these are the answers. A lot of people answered that this is a role of the Brazilian uh, government to invest in territorial planning, monitoring and uh, oversight second place with many answers to the role of traders, soy traders, of implementing a strong, transparent uh, commitment. So these are the two main answers to our very quick poll. And thus, I move on to Lisandro in the Kaki de Sousa, who is going to tell us a little bit more about the work, the results of the uh, Imaflora uh, project. And Lisandra, you have 10 minutes uh, also, okay? okay. And I will uh, let you know when you have a uh, short time to come. So thank you, Isabel, for the invitation and the others to come and share my knowledge uh, here uh, with you. I'd also like to, you know, say hello to Tiago and my uh, fellow uh, panel members. I think uh, it's very good for us to have uh, the possibility to have a debate uh, on this web now. So I'd like to start by talking about our Soy on Track, which is an initiative, a way through which Imaflora uh, works in the soy sector. And our goal for the program is to strengthen 
the implementation of social environmental commitments at the sector level, at the corporate level. Okay, and uh, our participation comes from the experience that we've had since the soy moratorium since 2010 of, you know, being responsible for supporting all the sort of discussion process for, of transparency in the sort of soy work group, but also to coordinate audit and evaluation committees and also, uh, uh, you know, coordinating, looking and reviewing the order verification protocols, uh, looking for continuous uh, improvement of the mechanisms, you know, the protocols, and also offer uh, training for the different uh, stakeholders and also assess the audit um, report. So this is a little bit about us, our role in Maflora, and also the Soy on Track uh, program, as we usually call our program. So here, uh, going on a little bit of what has been presented by Tiago Reyes, we have the first elementary's worth uh, highlighting is the recent deforestation and its concentration, okay? It is in a few municipalities. We have just over 300 municipalities that concentrate the most deforestation recently speaking in this, points to two important things that I'm going to highlight. The first is that we are seeing where we have the highest pressure and what are the companies that may be involved in this? This allows us to identify who's exposed to risks and also on the other side of the coin as it were uh, we can also uh, make these companies assume you know take up their commitment you know their ambition another aspect that i'd like to raise here with everyone and i'm going to try and speak not that fast so that people can understand me but this has much more uh, in relation to, I mean, despite us having private, public policies, commitments, there is a limitation as far as uh, delivering an effective deforestation conversion free supply chain, okay? Uh, not just forest ecosystems I'm talking about here. And this really points to opportunities in relation to improving strategies, strengthening tools, and that companies and stakeholders, partners uh, may actually bring to the fore. I'd like to point out here, and it's interesting for us to, what well, was it, 263,000 hectares with soy bean and uh, deforestation in the Amazon. This data corroborates the data reached uh, by GPS, in other words, uh, data done with satellite uh, reading, 173,000. Uh, hectares. This is actually quite interesting when we look at almost 6 million hectares of uh, soy in the Amazon. We see that there's a big volume that has deforestation, but these are just the deforestation polygons, okay, because we have the blockages in the actual farms, and there we have a possibility of having another area that can actually contaminate the chain and does uh, not have the result as far as the deforestation chain is concerned. And this is where we have the opportunities that we can actually uh, indicate, which is to reach full traceability vertically through the chain. And this is regardless of what type are we going to work with it, this is phased. I think that this is an urgent need. We need to discuss full traceability because a lot is said about you know, mass balance, physics, sort of segregation. There are opportunities that need to be uh, looked at, and there are arrangements that allow us to have this sort of soy volume. And then the other aspect that Atiago has brought us is transparency. In other words, is reaching a level of transparency that these studies, the, the sort of research brings to us for us to be able to support decisions, but also in relation to what can be reported as far as progress is concerned in a qualified, harmonious manner. In other words, the players, organizations that are implementing their ambitions, commitments for them to be able to show how each of them through their own responsibility evolve in relation to 
this sort of implementation. So I'm going to bring a little bit about what the soil on track has developed uh, recently. So we looked at this audience where we have complex information being reported in a lot of the times of this complexity is the result of a lack of key data for the analysis to be run. And then we have the issue of traceability where we can't see the chain uh, that deep as it were. And then we add to this criteria methodologies that are not as clear as we would like and bring a level of uh, a certainty. We can see this when we actually look at progress report and we have to strive to reach a level of harmonization. And then with this scenario, there's a compromise is uh, the sort of information scenario making uh, it more difficult to have access to this data. So those who actually need to have this data in relation to deforestation to conversion and we have another aspect that should actually come in with these human rights. And then for that, we've put two bits of materials together. So one is a guide that tries to address subsidies, you know, now supporting information for a conversion for us to be able to report the progress. And then the other is a guide to the soy value chain that helps us to interpret the data. So the idea here is to try and increase transparency, providing quality information. And we uh, release these two uh, guides, these two materials, as it were, with the support of the Nature Conservancy. OK, and then what do these guides kind of uh, help us with? Well, we always need to look at the supply chain, thinking that we always have a key factor, which is the originator of the factors so of the trader, you know, the person company that trades this, they need to analyze their chain and then report this information. So guide one is aimed at this link in the chain to provide the information, be it tangible for interpreting and more analytical comparative understanding on behalf of buyers and then all of this would unfold into all different uh, players who is importing the soy who is producing uh, animals using soy as you know protein feed stock for the animals and then anyone who's working with the soybean grain and then we have the brands the retailers in other words the companies that are going to commercialize this to the market as a whole. So it is important for us to have uh, the information harmoniously organized, clearly organized, so that the companies may make their decisions in relation to whether or not they're going to buy this product. And then finally, it is important for us to be able to understand what's being reported. So I think that this is, you know, key in the process, we have cut off dates, uh, such as in the past, I had a soy moratorium, we have cut off dates related to other regions, locations. So it's important for us to be certain in relation to these dates and when we intend on reaching this, because it is based on this that I establish a target to reach the commitments, you know, report and monitoring of the progress uh, can be um, can only be reached through this. And then we have essential information for deforestation and conversion. So how do traders attest the status that their soybean without deforestation, without conversion? What sort of percentage do you adopt? Where do you get your data from? You know, it's also very important for those uh, absorbing uh, the information, monitoring methods, is it, you know, based on polygons by farm, by risk, zoning area, the issue related to the percentage of soy reported, it refers to what total volume of soy sold, have they adopted a risk system? Okay, that needs to be clear, but the percentage needs to have a direct percentage in relation to the total volume. And then finally, how can I show the progress uh, evolving every year? Am I meeting? the targets, the deadlines. I mean, what are the measures that I'm going to um, roll out? So I need to organize this process based on quality, harmonious information in order for me to be able to report this to soy traders.
And basically, this was what I had, Isabel. Thank you. about uh, these uh, very important issues that uh, uh, Tiago and also Lisandro uh, present to us. I will start with uh, Laurent because uh, we heard from Tiago about the links with the European Union legislation. So we will start with Laurent and now after I turn to our other women <laughs> panelists. So, uh, Lohan, so again, thank you for joining us this day. So I, I'd like to, uh, to ask you about uh, the significance of the Cerrado and Pampas biomes in this data that Thiago present to, to us. Considering that we know now that the EU legislation says that um, the inclusion of the other wooded lands will be considered after a year. I'd like to ask you, uh, give the importance of this Cerrado and Pampas for Brazil, especially, but other uh, regions in the world. Uh, should the European Union mo move more quickly to cover all ecosystems in its regulation? What can, can you say to, to us? Thank you, Isabel. Uh, thank you, Thiago and uh, Lisandro. Thank you, to all participants. Um, it's indeed uh, very timely to have this discussion. Um, it's only uh, yesterday, late at night, that uh, uh, we got the final version of the um, EU regulation uh, for deforestation-free value chains. And uh, the seminar today gives me a chance to uh, clarify a few things that I've read, which I think are a bit uh, misleading in the press, in the, in the media, especially about the, the Cerrado. Um, so um, I, I'll share with you three, three elements for, for your consideration. Uh, the first one uh, is that when we read in the news that Cerrado is excluded, I think uh, this is not uh, exactly the case. Uh, first, um, the way you should look at it is that every single shipment of soy reaching Europe is covered by the, by the regulation, wherever it is coming from. So uh, whether the soy comes from Amazon, Cerrado, where, whatever uh, biome, when it reaches the EU market, we need to have the, 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 the certificate of, of uh, non-deforestation. Huh? So the traceability requirement applies to the whole Brazil and actually to the, the, the whole of our uh, exporters because it's not Brazil specific. So in that sense, the, 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 the traceability requirement already applies everywhere. Eh? That's point number one. Point number two, when you look at the statement, what you need to see is uh, the, the plot of land, the geographical origin of the soil. Um, and, and, and the, que the, next, the next question is, okay, was this plot of land uh, a forest or not in 31st December, 2020, okay? And that's where the issue of the definition of what is a forest uh, comes into play. Uh, of course, for Amazon, there's no discussion. For Cerrado, uh, as uh, Thiago's data was showing, uh, first there is a, um, a part of Cerrado which is covered with the existing def definition of, uh, of forest. So there is a part of the Cerrado which is covered. Thiago mentioned 26%. Uh, my colleagues in uh, Brussels have a, a slightly higher number in their estimate. Um, and most importantly, as I said, the regulation was, uh, the final version was agreed last, uh, yesterday, last night. Uh, so it's, it's not the end, or it's the end of the beginning because now we have to move on to the implementation. And, uh, and as you said, uh, in no later than one year, uh, we, we need to, as the commission, we need to reconsider the case of other wooded land, huh, which is the, the, the other definition that would cover uh, Cerrado. Um, it's actually, it's coming, it's tomorrow. I mean, uh, in one year, uh, we need to have a, a, an assessment about, about that. Please note that the, the requirement applies anyway 18 months 
18 months after the um, entry into force. So that means the commission needs to uh, reconsider and, and evaluate uh, all the wooded lands before the actual entry into force, uh, be, before companies have to apply the due diligence. Uh, and, and third point, um, for other ecosystems, uh, it's no later than two years after. So uh, I think when we, when we will look back five years from now, we will think, okay, it was actually super fast. Uh, the commission managed to, and the EU institutions managed to go through the whole regulatory system in one year. Usually it takes two years to, to achieve the same. So that's already fast track. And, and again, <clears throat> the deal of last night includes already um, a schedule for quick reconsideration of the, let's say, unfinished business. So, so uh, I'm very optimistic and uh, I, I am grateful for the data you're bringing to the table because that's exactly what we will need now to um, go case by case to be specific because as I, as I said, the regulation is for the world and now we need to look case by case. So. Uh, the, uh, the game is not over, the game is starting. I'm looking forward to work with you on this. Okay, thank you, Laurent. Thank you, yes, indeed, we need to, to look at the, uh, each country context, yes, to, to implementation. So now I will turn to, to our colleague, Deborah, because uh, you know also that regulation legislation laws are very uh, important, but we have also uh, private efforts. So we have the private sector doing their own commitments. So Deborah, thank you to, to join us. Uh, and I would like to ask to you, voluntary efforts are not, not uh, succeeding, um, being successful fast enough that uh, we need. What can be done to accelerate uh, their impact? Will, for instance, see the consumers good foreign support and contribute to the development of the or improvement of the uh, commitments and the enforcement of these uh, voluntary uh, commitments and other approaches? What can you say for us? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, I, I, I want to avoid giving a silver bullet uh, response. There are a number of factors. Um, I mean, as we've seen, it's it's incredibly important for uh, for us to have access to and be transparent about data on different sides. Um, for companies to be able to make informed decisions on the actions that they they can take, uh, it's incredibly important also for for the different actors who are involved in the supply chain um, to be able to demonstrate the impact that the actions that they're taking uh, is having on on the ground and in supply chains. Um, for for us, we we focused a lot of our work on uh, being very transparent and holding ourselves accountable and making sure we have very robust KPIs, but um, there is always that so what element um, that is important for, for all actors in the supply chain um, and governments as well uh, to be able to demonstrate we're all implementing a number of actions and policies and we need to be able to demonstrate which of those policies are, um, are creating impact and showing results. Um, and of course, uh, the data that Trace provides is very helpful in this uh, in this endeavor. Yeah, sure. So, so thank you. Uh, and now for for Lucy, uh, thank you, Lucy, for joining us uh, uh, too. And I'd like to to ask you. You know that the the last conference, climate conference, uh, we have the launch at the roadmap some very, very uh, important companies in the agricultural sector. Uh, so how do you think this roadmap can be reconciled with the zero deforestation commitments made, made by one of the, some of the members of the Soft Commodities Forum? Thanks for your question, Isabel, and thank you for having me here. Maybe before I jump in, and uh, just responding to a few points of the presentations from Tiago and, and Lisandro, I did just want to clarify for those who are listening in today, um, as this might not be 
obvious to all, but the, the Soft Commodities Forum publishes a biannual transparency report that includes the disclosure of each SCF member companies verifying deforestation and conversion free performance that's based on actual company data that covers both direct and indirect sourcing and that covers the fact that any soy that cannot be traced um, cannot be claimed DCF or verified DCF. So I just you know, just to, to respond to some of the uh, to the arguments that were made during the two first presentations. To your point about the roadmap, um, the first thing to keep in mind about the roadmap is the fact that it was a collective effort that was aimed at transforming an entire sector. So really, really an alignment exercise um, when you think about it before anything else, um, namely because the companies that signed on to this agri-trader roadmap that was announced at COP27 do not all move at the same pace, right? They don't have the same pain points. They don't have the same sourcing profiles. They don't have the same top management, right? Um, so company DNA varies when it comes to tackling deforestation and native vegetation conversion. So I thought that was an important point to, to make of, uh, of really recognizing the roadmap as an alignment exercise to really set a bar. Um, but so yes, to your, to your question precisely, there are individual company commitments that are more ambitious than the roadmap. And in fact, in multiple respects, the soft commodities form strategy is also more ambitious than, uh, than the roadmap. So I wouldn't necessarily speak of reconciliation Really, I would I would try and think of looking at where the roadmap provides additionality and ensuring that that additionality is transferred and absorbed by relevant implementation bodies. Um, so typically for soy, if you look at the soy aspect of the agri-trader roadmap, um, you will see that the one of the points that does bring additionality is the fact that Several companies have now brought their 2030 target dates to no later than 2025. Um, the roadmap also considers the inclusion of all soy products. Um, so th these are, in, you know, they're important steps forward, um, and I think they should be recognized as such and uh, and considered as additional to existing commitments. Thank you. Thank you very much, Luz. Yes, indeed, very very good uh, elements and points that you you bring to us. Uh, to um, uh, to to turn to our audience questions, uh, uh, I'd like to to put one more uh, question to panelists, uh, and I you ask for a very quick <laughs> answer. Sorry, <laughs> always the problem of time. But we, we know that um, uh, China market is very very important for soy, uh, for Brazilian soy. So I'd like to I I'd like to to ask you. What can be done to more closely collaboration with Chinese buyers in this supply chain sustainability efforts? What do you think about that? How to, to engage or to work more with Chinese buyers also? Um, maybe I can take this one to start. I'll try to be quick. Uh, so the, the CGF's uh, membership uh, spans about 250 consumer goods companies specifically, so retailers, manufacturers, and our, our scope is global. Uh, but the Forest Positive Coalition um, only includes 22 companies, although they, they have quite a large market share. They're mostly based in uh, EU and the US. Um, we do have members in China in the CGF, and for us, it's been very important to engage with those members to understand um, what are their motivations? Uh, what is the business case for them to uh, implement forest positive policies? And also to understand from their perspective how we can get the Chinese government uh, involved and engage the Chinese government. Um, a lot of the companies that are that we engage with in China um, are very much at the start of the journey. Uh, many of the companies that are in the Forest Positive Coalition are already leaders and um, taking many actions already on Forest Positive. So we do need to keep in mind that um, the challenges are different in different geographies, the motivations are different, and we need to cater to those and um, sort of create 
uh, bespoke approaches for, for these actors in different geographies, and especially China. Any other thoughts from Lucy or Lohan on China? I thought it would be interesting to, to hear from Laurent on this question, um, but maybe I was busy sharing a link, but um, the, the, the Chinese government seems very busy right now, but um, that's maybe besides the point. Um, in any case, the, the soft commodities forum members are open to multi-stakeholder workshops and, and consultations that could uh, that could take place in order to advance the, the Chinese legislative agenda on the on the deforestation and native vegetation conversion free agenda, um, be it with so with government, with civil society, with producers, with traders. Um, so we're very open to that type of collaboration if uh, uh, if that's something that's uh, that's going to come up in the next few months. Thank you. Thank you. So oh, so I guess we can uh, pick up some questions for for the audience, we have a few minutes uh, to do that. So um, I will start with uh, a question uh, to to Lucy uh, from, I think it's Boris. I don't know how to pronounce this, <laughs> this surname, but I think it's Boris from Might Earth, I think. Uh, so Lucy, uh, is it planning that the soy traders, or at least some, of them, will you stick to the EU uh, TR cutoff, so the cutoff date of the, the regulation, that is 2020, for all ecosystems for legal and illegal conversion? So either I'm missing something or this, qu this question is very straightforward because um, the traders will have to comply with the new requirements for all soy that's being imported on the single market, right? So it, they won't have a choice um, from what I understand. So uh, that's, it. I would say yes. Okay, hmm. thank you. Uh, Laura, uh, I, I have a, a note to give for our uh, organizers. Can you talk a, a little bit about the China question also maybe? Sorry yes, for that. I was, no, 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 it's my, actually it's my, my pleasure. Um, again, I can make two quick points on, on this. Uh, the first one is, um, of course, as, as Europeans, um, uh, we, we feel we are very satisfied with the deal we had yesterday. We feel it's a milestone uh, in, in the history to, to protect uh, for, uh, forest and, imported, uh, and fight against imported deforestation. Then we are also aware that um, um, we, we are just part of the solution. And um, as I said, again, it's just the end of the beginning. Now that we have our regulation, uh, we need to step in our engagement with both producing countries and also the buying countries. And that includes uh, China, of course. Um, as you know, I think it's actually today in Montreal, uh, COP15 on biodiversity uh, kicks in with uh, a Chinese presidency. So on the margins of COP15, we will also explain to our uh, Chinese partners what we are doing, why it's important, and, and, and hopefully see them uh, follow suit on the same type of, uh, of approach. And um, when I saw the, the list of uh, panelists for today, I was thinking uh, this year I'm the only diplomat, but hopefully next year when you release the next edition of the trade numbers, why not inviting uh, also a Chinese diplomat and, uh, and, and for good sake, the, uh, a US diplomat. And, and so then we will, have a, we will be able to pose them the question too. And I think that will be a, a great contribution to the debate. Thank you. Thank you, Lohan. So uh, we have some, some minutes. Uh, I will take a question uh, about, uh, about uh, other Chains in the supply chain. So just a minute to to get the question properly. I will ask to Lisandro. So Lisandro, prepare yourself uh, to do that. Um, where is it? It's very very interesting. Uh, yeah. So a question, Lisandro, if you can help us with the answer. How much soy produced in Brazil is consumed by livestock in Brazil? So we are we are talking about the market. 
before the livestock is, is slaughtered for export. Are these proposals to track these supply chains? I think you, you can uh, talk a little bit about these links with um, or between commodities, if you can do that. Okay, uh, Isabel, thank you. So uh, for these uh, two questions, the animal protein uh, sector in Brazil has been growing significantly. So we have, uh, you know, increased our production and this uh, huge volume of uh, grains, both soy and other grains, will have an increasing role in this sector. And as Thiago has said, 20% of all soy produced in Brazil is traded or consumed internally. Considering other commodities, it's very important to consider uh, corn because corn is in the second uh, harvest, say, for most soy uh, producers. So it's in the same uh, um, range and the same scope for soy producers. So when we think about a soy moratorium, actually it's a deforestation uh, moratorium, other commodities uh, should have been included or should be included in this type of arrangement. Because when you think about a climate emergency and our concern for uh, natural habitats and forests, well, this, you know, these concerns recognize no borders, no limits, and uh, they should include uh, other uh, agricultural commodities in the regions where they are significant and where they might generate uh, some sort of risks. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa. Uh, uh, so uh, I'd like to, where we are uh, almost on the top of the hour, uh, you'd like to comment any question, Tiago, if you want to comment any question or any other aspect that you don't uh, reach? Well, thank you, thank you, Bell. Uh, I'd like to talk about the importance of uh, engaging uh, with the Chinese government, as uh, Laurent said so well. I believe uh, that uh, China is the most important market today for uh, most commodities that are exposed to deforestation risks. But uh, I believe, you know, my view, of course, uh, I am not involved, let's say, in diplomatic talks as such, but my uh, perception from as an outsider is that China uh, or the Chinese government is uh, paying a lot of attention to this whole process that is being led by the European Union. So I believe, I have this uh, feeling and this expectation actually, that very soon uh, some regulations or measures that perhaps very similar to those issued by the EU, similar measures and similar regulations will be issued by the Chinese government. So this is something that, uh, you know, producer countries should be aware of and should get ready for it. So I don't believe that what the EU has done will be an isolated uh, action. I think it's, it's more a, a global trend. And uh, we have indications of that, that this is something that will be consolidated in the next few years. Thank you. Well, thank you, Thiago, and thank you, everyone. We have reached the end of this webinar. It's, usually, it's always uh, uh, too short the time for such important topics. I'd like to thank all uh, my colleagues uh, in the panel, uh, Thiago, Lisandro, the whole team, uh, 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 from Ima Flora and Trace that work together to make uh, this event possible. And uh, some very important topics for discussion were brought uh, during uh, this webinar. And I'd like to remind everyone that the most recent da uh, Trace uh, data are available online, including detailed explanation on how to understand the results and how to understand the Trace uh, methodology. So please feel free to visit uh, the TRACE website to learn more about it. And if you have any more questions uh, addressed to TRACE or to Ima Flora, please do not hesitate to send us an email. 
And as I said earlier, this webinar has been recorded in English and Portuguese, and we'll soon be releasing a, a link to everyone that's interested. So thank you very much for your attention. And we'll uh, close this event with a very uh, brief, very short uh, survey uh, so they can uh, give us some feedback on uh, how we did today. And thank you. I wish you all a great end of the week. Thank you. Thank you very much.